In the book of Colossians, last week we started this new book. Uh, this is only the second lesson in the book of Colossians, but we asked this question and I answered it as tersely as I can. What is the book of Colossians about? The question is, why did Paul pick up a pen? Why did God the Holy Spirit come upon Paul? Why did he bore him along uh, to write this book? I'll write this letter. And the end of the story is, the bottom line is, that the book of Colossians highlights the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. That the Christian life is, is lived with Jesus plus nothing. We can learn from Jesus. We learn uh, about Jesus in the Scriptures. That we learned last week that Jesus is to be, as we look, fix our gaze on Him, fix our eyes on Him, that He's to be... Uh, the ultimate model for the Christian live life, the author and completer of our faith. In Colossians, in, the, in Colossae, in the city, they had wandered off. They were going into legalism. They were going into Gnosticism, asceticism, we'll talk, mysticism. We'll talk about those things when we get there. But what Paul is writing the letter to say is all that garbage, all that self-help, new age stuff that Satan is bringing into the church is not needed. What's needed in the church is a focus on the supremacy and the sufficiency of the person and work of Jesus the Christ. And that's it. Jesus plus nothing. He's the creator of the world, as Paul brings out in Colossians. If you want to send someone to the Bible... To find out who this Jesus is, uh, Colossians is a great little letter to go to because, there, because G, uh, Paul is um, defending the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ that He's all we need. He brings out a lot of things about Jesus Christ. Ends up being one of the best Christological books in the New Testament. Uh, Hebrews would be another one. But in this book, we'll see that He's the creator of the world, Jesus uh, it came up last time, and I'll say this because it bothered someone who I love dearly, my little boy, Caleb King. When I mentioned that Jesus is the creator of the world, uh, Caleb likes to also add the fact that God the Father is the creator of the world, and hey, let's not leave out God the Holy Spirit, and he's absolutely right. I could show you pages in the Scripture and verses that highlight the fact that, the God, that, the, that God, Yahweh, is the creator, I could also show you in Colossians 1 that Jesus is the Creator, and Hebrews 1 and John 1 that Jesus is the Creator. And I could also show you a passage from the book of Psalms that says the Holy Spirit is the Creator. I don't want to split the Godhead up unnecessarily. We serve one God who exists in three persons. When the Bible gives a role to one of them exclusively, we'll split the Godhead. But let's not be in the... Let's not be too quick about splitting the Godhead. So when I said that He's the creator of the world, I wasn't being exclusive to, to the Son of God and that the Father and the Holy Spirit had nothing to do with that. Fair enough, young man? He's the head of the church. We'll find that out in the book of Colossians, that Jesus is the head. Remember, we're all called the body of Christ. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection. You're placed into union with Jesus Christ. We become part of the body of Christ. Every body has a head. It has a master. It has an authority. And Jesus is the head of the church. Paul says that to the Colossians very clearly. He says also that in Jesus Christ, this man was the fullness of deity in bodily form. The Gnostics were saying God didn't come in the flesh. Flesh is evil. All material things are evil. The spirit world is good. And they were starting to buy into that, that heresy that Jesus Christ maybe didn't come in bodily form. That God came but not as a human being. And Paul writes this letter to say, No, indeed, he came as Jesus of Nazareth, born of a virgin. He was fully human. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. So God the Father was satisfied, satisfied by his death on the cross. His payment for sin satisfied the Father. So the Father resurrected the Son as proof and seated him at his right hand until the Father makes the enemies of Jesus Christ a footstool for His feet. 
We could talk a lot about that. We'll talk more about these later. The Master, Jesus Christ, also we'll see in this book. He's the Master whom we serve. He's the rewarder of our faithfulness as Christians. We learn all about, all about that in the book of Colossians. And He is the image of the invisible God. He is the manifest person of the Godhead. Not the image in the sense of you take a picture and here's a picture of what God might look like. That's not what this means. He is the exact representation of the living God because He is the living God. But we need to ask a few questions here before we get into this book next week. And the questions are the who, what, when, where, why questions about this letter of the Colossians or to the Colossians. So the first question is who? We have to know the parties. If you're going to pick up the book, it doesn't matter what page you're on. If you're going to read the Bible, you have to know, have to know who the author is and who the audience is and what the occasion for writing is. We get into a lot of trouble when we just drop into a book and pull out a verse without understanding the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the context, the reason for the writing. So the who in this book, as we'll find very quickly in the first verse, is the Apostle Paul. This letter was written by the Apostle Paul to the believers, to the church. Very important that you understand that this letter was written to Christians. It's not about getting saved. It's written to saved people. It's written to the believers in the church in the city of Colossae. Here's the verse in Colossians 1, 1 and 2. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It was the will of God that called him, chose him to be an apostle. And then he adds another man that we'll speak of this morning. And Timothy, our brother, fellow Christian, brother. And here's the who, the who it's to. So Paul is addressing the letter from himself. I, Paul... And he's writing it to the saints, uh, the word hagias, a word that means set apart. These set apart to the, to the work and ministry of God, set apart unto God. We're saints. And so were they in Colossae, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were at Colossae. So Paul wrote it. <clears throat> we know a lot about the Apostle Paul from the Scriptures, from the book of Acts. There's a lot written about Paul. We know that he is from Tarsus. He's a Jewish man. Uh, he says that he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, so he was a strict adherent to the Mosaic Law. Uh, we know that Paul was a persecutor of the early church. When, uh, when Jerusalem was first being saved, Paul uh, stood by as, as uh, Stephen was stoned in hearty agreement of the stoning of Stephen, a Christian, the first martyr. Paul stood by, held the garments of those so that they could pick up stones and kill Stephen. Paul was there persecuting the early Christian church. We know that about Paul. We know that Paul was on a mission to the, the city of Damascus. He had asked the chief priest for letters so that he could go to Damascus, which is in Syria, and uh, arrest Christians this new way, arrest Christians in Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem to imprison them. And it was while Paul was on what, the, what people say are called the road to Damascus, it was on, while Paul, with these letters, was going to this city to persecute and arrest Christians that the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, appeared to him. Remember, it was a brilliant light, so brilliant that it made scales on Paul's eyes so that he couldn't see after this. And Paul, uh, Jesus said to Paul, Saul, his name was Saul of Tarsus at the time before he, his name became Paul, but he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it was at that time that Paul was introduced to the risen Jesus Christ, came to understand that Jesus was the Savior, that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Old Testament deliverer. He was the Jew from David's seed, the branch of Jesse. It was Jesus of Nazareth. Paul came to understand those things, became a Christian there on the road to Damascus. What else do we know about Paul? We know he's an apostle that's primarily called out to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle given the message, message I'm sorry, the mission to preach the gospel of Jesus to the Jews. Paul also taught the Jews, as was his custom, according to the book of Acts, every city he went into, the first place he went was the synagogue. 
And he'd speak to the Jews of Jesus Christ. And in almost every city Paul went into, as was the custom of the Jews, they kicked him out and Paul went to the Gentiles. But Paul was primarily, as the Scripture says in the book of Acts, very clearly sent as the, the apostle to the Gentiles. You and I, friends, are Paul's people. We're the Gentiles. This church exists because of the work of Paul years and years ago. We know that Paul was beheaded by Ciro, uh, Caesar Nero in probably 68 or 69 AD. Paul was, uh, after several times being imprisoned, he was finally imprisoned in Rome, and Nero uh, killed Paul by beheading him. We don't read that in the Scriptures. We've got good early historians, Josephus, Eusebius. Uh, we get a lot of information about the apostles from the historian named Eusebius. E-U-S, E-B-I-U-S, if you want to go look up Eusebius. A lot of this early apostolic information we get from his writings. So we know that Paul was beheaded by Nero in 68 or 69 A.D. Now somebody tell me, when did Jerusalem fall? When was Jerusalem destroyed by the Romans? A.D. what? What year? 70. Now, why do we know that Paul was beheaded in 68 or 69 A.D.? Because if you read this book and Paul's letters to all of the churches, you know what event you never hear about or read about? The destruction of Jerusalem in the temple. And Paul, a good Pharisaic Jew all his life, would obviously have made issue in the fact that God had taken the Jewish worship site because Jesus had replaced it. Uh, he would have written about it, but he didn't. Paul died in 68 or 69 A.D. at the hand of the Romans just before the temple was destroyed. Uh, but what about this guy? Oh, here's a couple of pictures of Paul. Uh, just like me to wait till the end. Here, there you go. Look at him. Look at him quickly. Soak him in. Incredible man. Incredible man gave his life, everything for me to live as for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. If anybody defined his life by the person of Jesus Christ, it was this man, who said, "I'm the chiefest of sinners and the worst of all saints. I don't deserve to be an apostle of, of Jesus Christ." I think Paul would have gone so far as to say, "I don't deserve to be saved by the work of this man, Jesus Christ, and yet I'm an apostle." <clears throat> A wonderful man. But what about this guy? Paul adds Timothy in this uh, salutation. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. We know a lot about Paul. I wonder if we don't know as much about Timothy. I want to make a few statements about Timothy. His name is Timotheus. If you read it in the Greek, it's not Timothy. His name is Timotheus. Theus is the Greek word for God. Uh, his name means, Timothy's name means honoring God. A well-named man, as we'll see in the verses I'm about to show you. A very well-named man. We first read about this young man, Timothy, at least a generation younger than Paul, if not two generations younger than Paul. In Acts chapter 16, we find we're introduced to this man, Timothy. Paul, one of Paul's missionaries' journey, it says Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. These are cities in Asia Minor, what we today call Turkey. Unfortunately, completely run by the Muslim Brotherhood. Once a bastion of Christianity, now a bastion of Satanism. Paul also came to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman, Listen to these facts the Bible tells us about Timothy. He was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, an unbeliever. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. By the way, when you read the book of Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians, we just finished going through it recently, was written to the churches of Galatia. These are the churches of Galatia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, these are the churches of Galatia. There were four churches. But this is where Timothy, this is where, where Paul picked up Timothy 
And Timothy latched himself on to Paul very, very closely, very tightly. Timothy is included. I'm not going to put these on the board, but just so you know, Paul includes this man, Timothy, in introductory salutations to all of these books of the Bible. 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. In six letters that Paul wrote, he included the name of Timothy in his opening salvo to the churches. Six letters he includes Timothy. What was so special about Timotheus, the one that honored God, that Paul allowed him to get so close into his inner circle? What was so different about Timothy? Look what the Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. Paul says this. Paul writes the letter of 2 Timothy to his pastor friend Timothy, this young man. And Paul says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Evniki, a Greek would say. And I am sure that it is in you as well. Another bit of background information about Paul, he was taught the Scripture, the Old Testament Scriptures, by his Jewish grandmother and his Jewish mother. He was well-versed in the Old Testament. He knew it inside and out, having been taught by the women in his life. Now, if women never take a role in the Bible, you women, circle this verse because Paul highlights the teaching of the Word having come from the women in, P in uh, Timothy's life. God the Holy Spirit leaves it for all generations to see for all time that there were two women, one named Lois and one named Eunice, that raised a man in the Word of God because his father wouldn't do it. His father, an unbelieving Greek, couldn't do it. But his mother did it. Look what we read about in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 about Timothy also. What does Paul like so much about this man? Look at who this man is. Look at his character. Look at his commitment to the Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul mentions his friend Timothy. And he says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Does Paul have no one else he can send? Why Timothy? For I have no, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else. Imagine this of Paul's entourage that traveled with him. Sometimes Barnabas, sometimes John Mark, Timothy, others, Luke. I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. He likes the heart of Timothy. Timothy's got a heart for the Christian church. For they all seek all these others that are around Paul. These are Paul's words, not mine. This is a, a harsh statement. And it would exclude those names that I spoke of, Barnabas and John Mark and Luke, but others around him. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you, Timothy, but you know, or no, he's talking to the, the Philippians, but you know of Timothy's proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. You want to talk about loyalty, faithfulness to a mission? Timothy. Timothy was the guy. And so what does Paul say? There is no one else I would send to your church. I'm sending Timothy. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And one more thing about Timothy. We're not told in the book of Colossians whether uh, Timothy is in prison with Paul. We know that Paul's in prison, but we don't know whether Timothy is. But the writer of the book of Hebrews lets us know that Timothy did spend time in prison. So the best we can say is he may be in prison with Paul while Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians. Look what Hebrews 13, 23 says. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released with whom if he comes soon I will see you. 
So Timothy spent time incarcerated. <clears throat> and I'm about to ask you the question, why? Why was Paul in prison? Why at whatever time that Timothy was incarcerated and later released, why was Paul, uh, Timothy, in prison? But we ask a question, when first? And let's just quickly answer this. Uh, the book is said to be have, uh, is known to have been written or said to have been written in 60 or 60 on, 61 A.D. 60 or 61 A.D. when Paul was in prison in Rome. It's also, this book of Colossians, one of Paul's four prison epistles. I know this is a lot of teaching, but we've got to get a foundation down so we can see what, why Paul wrote it, who he wrote it to, when he wrote it. You have to know all these things for this letter to come to life. It's one of Paul's four prison epistles. That's mean, that means he wrote this, this letter while he was in prison. While he was a Roman prisoner, Paul wrote this letter. The other letters are these, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. The four prison epistles of Paul. We just went through the book of Philemon three week, in the last three weeks. Uh, I just want you to remember while we remember the things of Philemon and his runaway slave Onesimus and how Paul represented Onesimus into Philemon's life, giving Philemon the choice to do the Christian thing and accept Onesimus as an equal brother in the Lord rather than a slave. This guy Philemon, Onesimus, Aphia, Archippos, their son, all lived in the city of Colossae. They were in the church of Colossians that this letter is going to that we're about to read. Philemon and his family were there. So Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. But to, answer, to ask the other question, and we're going to spend a few minutes on this question, somebody tell me what, one word, one word only. Why was Paul in prison? Why was Timothy in prison? One word. Why? Why did Rome imprison these men over and over? <clears throat> Not specific enough. Not Christianity. Nope. Not specific enough. Not specific enough. Starts with an R. Who said it? He was imprisoned for preaching the resurrection of the dead. Look at these verses. makes it very clear in the book of Acts exactly why these men were being imprisoned. Uh, make no mistake <clears throat> that the, Jew, uh, the Romans didn't have any problem with religion. They didn't have any problem with religion. They, they worshipped a pantheon of false gods. I'll name you a couple. Cupid. God, uh, this... Uh, what day is it? A couple days? February 14th? Cupid's Day. He's a, she was a Roman god. He, whatever that thing is. God of love. Apollo, sun god. Jupiter. We look at on our universe and you listen. I, I've told you before the names, every name, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all come, Sunday, all come from the pagan from the pagan world, the sun, God day, the moon, God day, uh, Thor's day is to all pagan gods, all pagan gods. What are the names of our planets? Jupiter is the king of the gods in the Roman world. Mars is the god of war. Pluto is the god of the underworld. Saturn is the god of the, god of the harvest and the agriculture. Venus is the god of love. Mercury was the messenger of the gods. We look around at everything that man has named and it's all pagan. <clears throat> it's all around us. So the Romans had no problem with religion and worshiping gods. Paul wasn't on trial because he was a religious man preaching a religion, a, a theology. Where Paul stepped over the line is when he said men came back from the dead. Paul says this, having a, he is on trial before King Agrippa. In Acts chapter 26, and this is what he said, So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying. He's on trial for his life. I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, the great being the king Agrippa, the small being anybody who will listen. Stating that nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. He goes all the way back into the scrolls. 
He goes all the way back into the Old Testament. And he says, from the Garden of Eden, this deliverer has been known. The one that, the one that would be the seed of the woman to crush the head of Satan. He goes all the way back to the early writings of the prophets and of, of Moses, the Pentateuch. He says all these things that Messiah were, were, uh, was go going to do on earth, they were all spoken of beforehand. I give you Isaiah 53 as an example of the suffering servant, the one who was pierced for our iniquities, etc. The Bible, the Old Testament, paints the picture of who the suffering servant would be and also the conquering king, the Messiah. But he says in Paul's defense of himself, the Old Testament said all these things, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of His resurrection, and that's when the ire of everybody came up, because men die and we bury them, and they don't walk around again. By reason of His resurrection from the dead, He would be the first to proclaim light, both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Look at what it says in Acts 17. Now these are two group, Greek groups. Remember, Greece was the civilization that fell when Rome came up. So Greece, the Epicureans and the Stoics were Greeks, but the Romans came along and simply renamed their theologies, renamed their philosophies, and renamed their gods. Rome had no problem with religion. But here in Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill in a, group, a Greek city, it says, and also some of the Epicurean and Stoics. Now the Epicureans advocated the pursuit of pleasure. If it feels good, do it. That was the Epicureans. The Stoics were the opposite. They were the advocates of uh, self-control, self-abasement. And so two, two very different groups would get together and the idea was they would share these philosophies in these Greek cities. They loved their orators. They loved their Aristotle and their Plato. They loved the men who would get up and speak to the masses and all. They loved to philosophize. That's who these people were. But two very different groups here, some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers were talking with Paul. And this is what they were saying. What would this idle babbler wish to say? And others were saying he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. Strange deities, not deities like the ones we worship. Strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That this man lived, this man died, we all witnessed it. And three days later we saw him come out of that grave and walked with him and talked with him and ate with him and prayed with him. That was the problem. Acts chapter 24, verse 21, Paul says, other than for this one statement, look at Paul, narrow it down here, other than for this one statement which I shouted out while standing among them. And this was the statement that got him in trouble for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you. Why did Paul go to court? Because Paul preached that Jesus of Nazareth came back from the grave. And nobody could abide that. It was not only heresy to the Jews, it was heresy to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and they put him in prison for it over and over and over. They also imprisoned Peter. Look what it says in Acts chapter 4. Peter. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. Now the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Being greatly disturbed. Now why are the people, the priests, the captain of the guard and the Sadducees, why are they disturbed? What is disturbing them? Look what it says being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It was because this man Jesus proclaimed at least three times to his disciples that I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles. They're going to scourge me, whip me, beat me. They're going to crucify me and in three days I'll rise again from the dead. Jesus proclaimed this about himself. 
But when these men finally were introduced to the glorified, resurrected Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, you couldn't stop them for anything. They all, except for John, gave their lives as martyrs to the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these early disciples who saw Him resurrected. This is why they were on trial. Because they were preaching and teaching and proclaiming to the world what the book of Acts says, turning the world upside down, turning the world on its head, that men can come back from the dead. Men can be resurrected. And they thought, Paul, you have gone mad because of your teaching. You're in the books too much. You've gone mad, is what Agrippa told him. I think it was Festus that told him that. Agrippa said, Paul, you're convincing me almost to become a Christian myself. Peter did the same thing. He was preaching the resurrection, and that's what got him in trouble. Look what it says in the very next verse. I'm just asking the question, why was Paul in prison writing the letter to the Colossians? Why would he have to be in prison? Because he would not stop preaching that Jesus was crucified and buried as a dead man and resurrected from the dead three days later to live eternally. The world couldn't abide it. So Peter taught the people, proclaimed in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So the very next verse, what was the world's response? They laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. Why were the men going to jail all the time? Because men, we saw it happen. One came out of the grave. And because that one came out of the grave, I will also come out of my grave. And we will come out of our graves. And the world just couldn't, they just couldn't put, wrap their arms around the truth <clears throat> of everlasting, eternal, glorified, imperishable, immortal life. They were scared by it. They were disturbed by it. So they imprisoned the people that were preaching that. So the reason, again, that Paul's religion and Peter's religion, if you can call it a religion, was so controversial, their, theory, their, their body of theological facts, the reason it was controversial was because, again, they were preaching something brand new on earth. That if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will live forever and will be resurrected and you won't have this mortal body, but mortal will put on immortal and perishable will put on imperishable. And the people just couldn't buy it. I wonder how many today still can't buy it. We're going to ask the question now where. <clears throat> Let's go quickly through this. Colossae. <clears throat> A little arrow is going to come up. Look at the arrow. Modern day Turkey. Turkey. Colossi is right there. Look at those uh, Yeriopolis, the city right, be right beside it, and Laodicea. Laodicea gets famous because in the book of Revelation, Jesus has words for this church at Laodicea. But Colossi and Yeriopolis and Laodicea were this, were this triangle of churches, uh, of, of churches and cities. Uh, we have cities today, Minneapolis, St. Paul, so close together, they call them the twin cities, right? In this day, they would have called these the, the, the triplet cities. Very, very closely related. About 100 miles, if you just want to get a, a, a scale from Ephesus. Here's the book, of, uh, the church in Ephesus. From Ephesus to Colossae is about 100 miles, just so you see what we're talking about. So... Uh, but they were closely related to these two cities, and why is that happening? Oh, just a different map. Show you again where it is. By this time, the map wrote or just the map maker took Colossi's name off of it. I told you before, Colossi was an in insignificant town. Uh, it, it was uh, bypassed by the Roman road, uh, and everything went away from Colossi and through Laodicea later. So on this map, they don't even show up, but here's a closer of it. It's in the Lycus River Valley. You see there the Lycus River? Lycus River, known for its cold water <clears throat> that Colossi had. Uh, this is what it looks like in modern day. It's a mountainous area. It's not flat. It doesn't look like South Texas does. Uh, it looks like Turkey. Uh, imagine Mount Ararat. What happened on Mount Ararat? Noah's Ark came to rest. Turkey's a mountainous country. It's not like 
It's not like we are here. But a couple of verses, Colossians 4, verse 13, considering or concerning how closely related these three cities are. I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those, and not only for you Colossians, but for those who are in Laodicea and Europolis. Very closely related triplet cities. Triplet cities. Uh, uh, just, just a thought. Ro- in the book of Revelation, does anybody remember what the Laodiceans, remember they're very closely related to the Colossians, why the Laodiceans were put down by, by the Lord Jesus Christ when he evaluated their church? What did he say about the Laodiceans? You are what? He called them something. You're lukewarm. You're neither hot or cold. And you say, well, okay, what does that mean? Did it have any bearing on the geography that God created in Laodicea and Europolis? And I'll tell you this, uh, uh, Europolis had uh, a hot spring. Europolis was known for a hot spring, and they would, on an aqueduct, pipe the hot spring water over to Laodicea. But what do you think happened to the water in that five or six or seven mile journey in this open aqueduct by the time it got to Laodicea? Was it still hot? No, it was now lukewarm. Colossae, on the other hand, had the Lystra, uh, I mean the, uh, the Lycus River, known for its refreshing cold water. So from the other side, Uh, Colossae would send the Laodiceans their cold water on an open aqueduct. And what do you think would happen to that cold water by the time it made the six or seven mile trip to Laodicea? Became lukewarm. When you read about these things in the Bible, there's always a background to it. These things all have meaning. The reason Jesus, the reason the, the writer of the Scriptures and God the Holy Spirit choose the words they do, they all have depth and meaning. You just have to unpack the Bible to get to it. But it's there. Uh, Paul did not visit these cities. Paul was in Ephesus. Paul was in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth. Uh, Paul did not go to the city of Colossae. He didn't go to Laodicea and he didn't go to Hierapolis. In Colossians 2.1, we get that fact. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those, and not only you in Colossae, but those who are in Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. So Paul never went to these cities. Paul sent people like Timothy to find out how they were doing. Uh, And why, we'll get back to the why next week as we start the book, the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. You Colossians have to understand, you don't need any other religious system, you don't need legalism, you don't have to add to the text, you don't need mysticism, you don't have to worship angels, you don't need asceticism, the don't eat, don't touch, don't... You don't need that. And in, uh, in the book of Colossians, he pounds all these systems of theology that are coming into Colossae and saying you don't need any of that. What you need is to fix your eyes on Jesus the Christ. Learn about Him, learn from Him, and live your life exactly like Him. And the Father will be pleased. That's what the letter's about. Let's close in prayer. Please.